It's one of those weeks where I need to have a difficult discussion with someone. We all have times where we have difficult discussions, right? Personal or professional. There's no avoiding them, unless you do. Avoid the discussion, I mean. And that might make you feel good. Just ignore the situation or the person. But does that really alleviate suffering? Hi, it's Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma Podcast. I'm a Buddhist practitioner out here in the world, having experienced the loss of my loved ones and knowing how much my Buddhist practice helped me on my grief journey. And now together we have this safe space to discuss death, dying, grief, and the Buddhist teachings that help us really understand attachment, impermanence, being compassionate, being death ready, what it means to live a life so that we can have a peaceful death. Yep, it's a big topic and we're going to take it on together. Let's go. Do you tell that team member that he or she or they is underperforming or you drop hints and compliment others who do terrific work and hope that the underperformer catches on? Do you explain your boundaries to others or just ghost people who don't seem to understand? And if there's someone who you don't want to spend time with, do you just ignore invitations from that person and ghost them? Or do you tell them? And if so, how? What do you say? In our desire to avoid our own suffering, either from people who do not share the same boundaries or people whose company we do not enjoy or team members who do not do a good job, we might be unfairly causing these individuals more suffering I can think of a time when I had an employee who was doing a terrible job and I avoided him and I did not have good discussions with him until it was time for his yearly review where he received a horrible score and no raise. He was shocked and I was annoyed. He didn't know that he was doing a bad job in my head. I was thinking, how could he not get this? But I was not being fair. In my rush to protect myself from difficult discussions, I caused him even more suffering. This was a situation that called for two types of compassion or two ways to draw upon compassion, compassionate directness and fierce self-compassion. And these two could have helped reduce the suffering of the employee and the suffering I later felt because I realized that I had been unfair. I had been a bad boss. And while right now I am drawing on a professional situation to illustrate some key points, Each of us can recognize times in our personal lives where instead of avoiding a difficult discussion or addressing boundary-breaking behaviors, we took what we thought was the easy path, the path of avoidance. But avoidance leads to hard feelings, additional misunderstandings, and I I don't think it's creating positive karma. The idea of compassionate directness comes to us from Ariana Huffington, and definitely she speaks and writes about it as an organizational cultural value that can give your organization a competitive value. Let's level set right here, right now. This is the Death Dhamma podcast. And this season we are talking about helping to alleviate the suffering of others. So in that context, do we care about compassion as a workplace strategy? What we care about is helping ourselves and others gain release from suffering. Now you can say that difficult, toxic workplaces give all of us plenty of opportunity to grow in our practice. And you would be right. We also have the ability to create an environment with less stress and toxicity so that all of us can move forward. What does it mean, compassionate directness? It's really about empowering employees to speak up, to give feedback, to disagree, and to raise problems up and pain points and offer up constructive criticism. And to be able to do this immediately, continuously, and with clarity, but also we're gonna balance that with some compassion, empathy, and understanding. With this as the foundation of company culture, both employees and the business can course correct, overcoming challenges, grow, evolve, achieve peak performance. I did not allow my employee the opportunity to achieve peak performance because I did not step in and give him any opportunity to course correct. So I didn't allow him to reach his highest potential and to thrive. Too many companies or too many companies believe that we have to choose between being direct and being compassionate, right? Being honest and effective, 
and being considerate and understanding. But that's because we're confusing being nice with being, you know, compassionate and direct. So compassion and being direct, that's, these are not mutually exclusive things. They're independent qualities. They can be nurtured and they can be brought together. So it's not that, you know, that person you work with, that brutally direct person that doesn't believe in sugarcoating things. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I'm just going to tell you how it is. And I expect you to just be able to deal with it. It's not sugarcoating, but it's also delivering feedback in a way that considers who is receiving it and the best way to give that feedback. So it's not that person that's very proud of their direct way to tell the truth and they just blurt things out and see how you all deal with it. It's encouraging people to share their thoughts, their concerns and challenges they see, absolutely, but not just throwing it out there to see how everyone deals with it. Learning to communicate it in a way that it can be taken and absorbed because there's trust and caring. And then anyone, any of us are more likely to listen and to probably act upon the feedback. So feedback's got to be given and received in a constructive way. So it's got to be done with, sure, directness, because we don't want to say things in such a confusing way that no one knows what we're talking about, but with real compassion and empathy. It's not about being soft. It's about acknowledging how we work as humans and that we bring our whole selves to the workplace. And that is such an important phrase. And I remember years ago, I was setting off, I was going to maybe do some co some coaching with people who are having conflict and challenges at work. And that idea of we bring our whole selves to the workplace has always been an important theme to me in my other work I do, you know, in project management. Uh, so yeah, we do bring our whole selves to work. Whether Whatever our belief system is, it comes with us, no matter how much we may try to hide it, right? So as Buddhists, we bring our ability to be mindful, our ability to recognize the truth of suffering. We cling and attach. I want to be the top performing employer. I don't want to be embarrassed by being called out in front of my colleagues. And as leaders, we often fear being perceived as soft, but I always appreciated what Jack Cornfield has says on this set has said on this topic. Compassion is not foolish. It doesn't just go along with what others want so they don't feel bad. There's a yes in compassion, and there's also a no said with the same courage of heart. Okay? And so it doesn't mean I don't say something difficult because I'm afraid that I will upset you, it does mean that I find a way to say what I'm going to say in a way that I can deliver it knowing that it could be upsetting to you and in the best possible way. And let's acknowledge something though. When we need to have difficult discussions with people, even with our, I'll say our pre-work and our thinking about how can I deliver this in the best possible way to this person, you know, and thinking about timing and how to think, say things and how this might impact their feelings, we still might upset people. We still might upset people, right? So this is, again, there's that yes, and there's this no, and the courage of heart. And there's this, uh, what Jack Cornfield calls the, the fierce sort of compassion, right? So it's the power of saying something difficult, or it might even be the power of giving that review after you let somebody know they're not performing and they don't step up. It might be the breaking of a relationship, uh, whether that's, you know, employment or personal, right? So that's, we still use that fierce sword, right? You know you're practicing compassion fiercely and fairly when you can say no or have the difficult discussion without feeling anger or fear. That's what you and I want to be able to do and is to be able to come to a place without having hard feelings. I had hard feelings towards this employee why is he doing such a bad job? I mean, I took it personally, right? Why is he, why is he doing such a bad job for me? You know, and it had nothing to do with me. 
it had to do with whatever was going on with his life or his you know values of work etc but we need to be able to come to this place where if we need to sit someone down and have that difficult or when we need to have that difficult discussion with someone whether it's personal or professional that we can do so without having hard feelings do you want to be angry at them I'm going to be angry at them for doing a bad job or angry at them because now I have to tell you I don't want to spend time with you anymore or whatever it is. We want to be able to come from a place of equanimity to be calm and be able to talk about what is happening and why. When I, so when we've got this culture of compassionate directness in the workplace, people are going to respond. They want to have their voices heard. They want to be respected to get the honest feedback they need to reach their full potential. And so in the workplace situation, it's I'm sharing this with you because I know that we can together, we can be better. You can do better. I want you to be better. In a personal discussion, it might be because I want our friendship to be deeper, right? We can have a better, deeper, more trusting relationship. Today's at work, you know, people place a value on engagement transparent, and transparency. And that you know, opportunity to grow. So at the work, in the workplace, we want to give them that opportunity to grow. So when we learn to be better communicators, we're more creative, we take more risks, and we're far better able to identify problems and course correct before they become crises. Crises, excuse me. And in our personal relationships, when we can work with someone and invite them to share and to find opportunities for us to get along better and to deepen our connection, then that also becomes something that we can do together. That's something we can do together. So, you know, this isn't just about making a company more pleasant place to work, although it certainly does. And it's not just about driving outcomes and a competitive advantage. It is really about building those trustful relationships and helping people have less suffering in the workplace when we are using compassionate directness at work. It's not gonna come easy possibly. For many of us, compassionate directness doesn't come easily at first, whether it's personal or professional. That's okay. That brings us back to fierce compassion or fierce self-compassion. If we cannot offer up ourselves some self-compassion to recognize when we could have done a better job in being direct, or in how we broached a topic or how we treated someone, then we're going to be stuck. We're going to be stuck. So we need to use our self-compassion. And you know what? We also want to teach the people around us to use self-compassion so that when we have to provide feedback that could be difficult, they don't spend all day beating themselves up. Oh, I'm such a terrible employee. No. We are working on this together and here's this opportunity for improvement. And so it will get easier with practice. And when we have these discussions from a place of true compassion, you know, again, not from a place of avoiding difficulty, then you're helping others with suffering. Even if, you know, you need to say something that somebody prefers not to hear, it's better to be able to have the discussion than to bring about those other you know, behaviors, ghosting, expecting people to just know, because that really only leads towards more suffering. I've got books for you, starting with Carpooling with Death, How Living with Death Will Make You Stronger, Wiser, and Fearless, the book that got me going and helped me to discuss going through the death of my loved ones, followed by Sitting with Death. Buddhist insights to help you face your fears and live a peaceful life based on season one of the Death Dhamma podcast. And just recently, Enlightenment Unleashed, how your pet can lead you to spiritual transformation because during our lifetime, we may see the rising and ceasing of many pets and we love them like they are our family. Find these on amazon.com or come see me at margaretmaloney.com. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma Podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on margaretmaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, 
and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.